Somewhere in space, the probe Voyager is carrying a gold-plated copper disk, which contains basic information about our planet for the edification of extraterrestrials that might find it. Part of this information is an image of a man and a woman. Do you notice anything about this picture? The man is taller than the woman, as if that simply goes without saying. All around the world, women are on average smaller than men. Even among Northern Europeans, currently the tallest humans in the world, women are roughly 15 centimeters shorter. On a enormément de mal à imaginer que que les choses pourraient être pourraient être inversées, que les hommes soient plus petits que les femmes, un monde où dans la rue vous voyez l'inverse de ce qui se passe aujourd'hui. There are species, however, where the female is bigger than the male. Sexual size dimorphism, as the scientists call it, isn't always what we imagine it to be. In the blue whale, the female is bigger than the male. So uh, the, the biggest mammal on the planet, it's not just a blue whale, but it's a female blue whale. Did you know that? That the biggest creature on Earth is female? So why is it that among us humans, the male is always larger? <laughs> oh, it's a great problem to work on. Understanding dimorphism helps us to understand ourselves. It is an important question, I think, to understand why we are the way that we are. Allez, viens. Tiens, vas-y, mets-toi là. Vas-y, serre bien les pieds. Voilà, rentre le ventre. Regarde, regarde droit devant. Voilà. Pour grandir, il faut de l'énergie. Il faut de l'oxygène qui arrive dans les cellules. Il faut des hormones pour alimenter l'ensemble de la de la machinerie. Donc la croissance est vraiment une, une résultante de plein de facteurs. Medicine tells us that our growth is controlled by a complex interaction of hormones, the best known of which being the growth hormone. Secreted by the pituitary gland in the brain during sleep, this travels in the blood down to the liver where it triggers the secretion of other hormones, which make the bones grow. In fact, it's the supple cartilage at the extremities which grows and then solidifies. This process continues until adulthood, around the age of 18. Our size depends on our genetic inheritance. This is clear to see. There are tall families and short families. But even within one family, not everyone is the same size, and the men are usually bigger. Could there be a tallness gene for men and a shortness one for women? Dans les dernières années, il y a eu beaucoup d'efforts pour essayer de savoir à quel endroit sur les, les 30 000 gènes du génome, eh bien, il y a des gènes qui euh, jouent un rôle dans cette variation de la taille. Il y a eu beaucoup d'efforts là-dessus. Ces efforts, pour l'instant, ils nous ont dit que dans plein d'endroits du génome, des, des dizaines de régions, il y a des régions qui jouent un tout petit rôle mais finalement qui, pour l'instant, n'arrive pas à expliquer plus que 5% de cette variabilité. Donc c'est clair que dans les années à venir, il y aura des progrès qu'on arrivera mieux à le comprendre, mais pour l'instant, on reste assez frustré entre, d'un côté, on sait qu'il y a beaucoup de génétique dans la variabilité, puis de l'autre côté, les données actuelles montrent qu'on n'en explique qu'une toute petite partie avec les gènes tels qu'ils sont, qu sont connus. So, if size depends on all these genes, couldn't we women be just as tall as men? In fact, aren't we already catching up? Everyone says so. Girls, as well as boys, are getting taller and taller. Maybe that 15 centimeter difference will soon disappear. Yes, we are on average taller than our parents, who were taller than their parents before them. All the same, our great-great-grandparents were far from being Lilliputians. To get an idea of how sizes have changed, we need to shift our attention from the individual to groups, to entire populations. This is the work of historians. They calculate the average size of populations and study the variations. It's called anthropometry. Using army enrollment records, Laurent A. Berger has been able to trace variations in height in Europe over a period of four centuries. On ne devient pas de plus en plus grand. On observe en fait des périodes de croissance et puis de décroissance. On est plus dans des phénomènes d'ordre cyclique que linéaire. 
Pour le, le XXe siècle, on constate qu'il n'y a pas d'évolution régulière de la, de la stature, enfin de, de croissance donc régulière de la stature, mais au contraire, on a des pays où on assiste à des stagnations, voire même à des, à des régressions, Alors, surtout au début du XXe siècle, mais encore tout récemment, donc pour les cohortes de naissance 1970, des, des décroissances naturelles. A cliché bites the dust. We're not getting ever taller. Some would say, on the other hand, that we are getting fatter. But that's another story. Concernant les femmes, il n'y a pas de, de femmes qui font leur service militaire, donc on a recours à des registres de prison. On n'a pas d'indication sur les femmes avant le, le 19e siècle. Or, l'histoire anthropométrique montre que dans cette période de, de difficulté, surtout de la première moitié du 19e siècle, la stature diminue, mais la stature des femmes, en général, diminue avant celle des hommes. Et quand la reprise a lieu, la stature des femmes augmente plutôt après celle des hommes. So are men always going to tower over us by those extra few centimeters? We're never going to catch them up if we're always the first to shrink and the last to start growing again. There must be some explanation for these changes. Alors, 1m36,8. Voilà, parfait. Il y a bien sûr euh, des variations qui ne sont pas euh, dans le génome, mais qui sont des variations dans l'environnement. Le, dans Et euh, on, on connaît quand même beaucoup d'exemples de situations qui modifient la taille, soit à court terme, soit à long terme, et euh, qui dépendent non pas de la génétique, mais, euh, mais clairement de, de l'environnement. Diet is a key factor in growth. In order to grow, we need calcium and certain proteins found only in eggs, fish, meat, and dairy products. Living conditions also come into play. A healthy pace of life, children who are not forced into labor, it all contributes to achieve what is known as one's growth potential. Studying people's sizes, therefore, gives historians an insight into the lifestyle of whole populations. Populations of men, of course. L'avantage de ces registres, c'est qu'on a, surtout quand il s'agit de registres de conscrits, euh, l'ensemble de la population qui est enregistrée. Donc ça permet de voir, par exemple, que, en général, les, les cols blancs sont, sont plus grands que les cols bleus, que les, les ouvriers agricoles et les ouvriers du textile sont parmi les, les plus petits. Et en Angleterre, pour citer cet exemple, où là, les inégalités atteignent vraiment des, des, des sommets au début du 19e siècle, à, à la période de l'adolescence. Les, les aristocrates euh, dominent euh, littéralement de 15 cm en moyenne les, les rejetons euh, des classes populaires londoniennes. There it is again, the 15 cm difference. Size then is an indicator of social class, living conditions, diet and health. Ici règne une hygiène stricte d'où n'est pas absente une certaine coquetterie. Surveillé et soigné par un personnel nombreux, attentif et qualifié, ce petit monde recouvre peu à peu la santé sans presque s'en apercevoir. What was true in centuries gone by is still true today. The same processes are at work, and doctors can now explain how the body can stop growing. Dans des situations de famine, eh bien, on a dans notre système, dans notre génome, euh, des, des éléments qui permettent de réguler la croissance et finalement de protéger les fonctions essentielles, comme par exemple le développement du cerveau, au détriment, je dirais, d'une fonction qu'on peut considérer comme un peu de luxe, c'est-à-dire la croissance. L'organisme arrête de grandir pour se protéger euh, et, et pas euh, gaspiller euh, l'énergie qui est en, en toute petite euh, quantité. Donc il y a une plasticité entre notre patrimoine génétique et puis les influences extérieures qui finalement euh, nous euh, modèlent tel qu'on est euh, au niveau de, de la taille adulte. Size then is the combined result of our genome and our living conditions. But that still doesn't explain why women are 15 centimeters shorter. Pendant l'enfance, garçons et filles grandissent à peu près de la même façon. 
les filles démarrent plus tôt, grandissent un petit peu moins pendant la puberté. Les garçons, ils ont plus le temps de grandir avant le développement de leur puberté, et puis ils grandissent un peu plus pendant leur puberté. Et finalement, c'est deux différences, une différence dans, dans, le, euh, dans la chronologie et une différence dans l'amplitude. Ben, c'est ça qui fait la, la différence moyenne euh, qui existe entre les, les hommes et les femmes. So there's the explanation. Boys grow for longer than girls. As far as the doctors are concerned, our film would end right here. Fair enough, they need to know how the body works in order to treat it. But if we want to know why this is so, we'll have to look elsewhere. We've gone as far as we can with our medical investigation. It's time to turn to evolutionary biology. The finding that there are growth differences between males and females is expected because males and females differ in size. So they had to grow differently in some way to get that way. So the growth differences are an observation. They're not an explanation for the size. Males and females differ in size. Of course they grew differently. They had to. Why they grew differently? If there was some special reason that growth occurs differently in males and females. Now that's a different question than as to why the adults differ in size alone. If we want to go further than mere observation, however precise that may be, we must enter the dimension of time and look at our evolutionary place among other species. Welcome to the world of Charles Darwin, in which human beings are just another primate and where even a lizard can teach us something about ourselves. Effectivement, des différences de croissance peuvent expliquer des différences de taille entre mâles et femelles. Mais cette croissance, là encore, ce n'est pas un paramètre qui va être fixe pour une espèce dans tous les environnements. Pour le lézard vivipare euh, sur lequel je travaille, effectivement, les femelles sont toujours plus grandes que les mâles. Mais chez d'autres organismes comme les tortues, par exemple, on observe que ce dimorphisme peut varier en fonction des conditions environnementales. Euh, dans certains cas, ça sera les femelles qui seront plus grandes. Et dans des conditions euh, contrastées euh, opposées, ça sera les mâles qui seront plus grands que les femelles. Donc on ne peut pas véritablement dire que pour toutes les espèces, le dimorphisme est fixé. Chez l'homme, qui est un animal comme les autres, les mêmes processus de sélection peuvent se mettre en place. Et de ce fait, le dimorphisme sexuel de taille n'est, à mon avis, pas fixé. So men could be smaller than women, like with the lizards. It's not an absurd idea, it's sound evolutionary biology. But haven't men always been bigger than women? Just look at little Lucy, for example our three million year old Australopithecus ancestor. So the question is, in the fossil record, how can you tell if you find two different forms in the same fossil site and they look fairly similar? Are they male and female, a big male and a small female? Or are they perhaps two different species? And Lucy here provides a very good example. The archeologist decided that Lucy was a female because she was small. And in that same fossil site, you find big specimens, so uh, they were called the males. And what, what is certain is there are small specimens and big specimens. The question is, how can we tell that the small ones are females and the big ones are males? And in fact, among primates, there are cases where females on average are bigger than males. I think from the outset, an assumption was made too rapidly. Because she was small, she was female. And these two things are, are pretty circular. So it's, uh, it's a, an open question as far as I'm concerned. So I wouldn't at this point say which of those two is correct. I think it's possible that we have small females and big males. But it's also still possible that there are actually two species involved. And I do not see any scientific way in which we can be sure about the answer to that. Some scientists then have believed it to be so self-evident that men must be larger than women that Lucy was declared female simply because the fossil was on the small side. It seems the prejudice about size differences so firmly anchored in our minds 
it can even interfere with scientific analysis. But why do we need to go so far back to seek the reasons for our present-day dimorphism? What exactly does the theory of evolution have to tell us? Scientists posited an initial hypothesis regarding a genetic mutation causing larger size, but which was only active in males. Such a mutation would have produced a taller man who would have passed on his increased size to his male descendants, but not to the females. If the larger size procured a reproductive advantage, it would have spread, and the size of men generally, but not that of women, would have increased. The question now has to be, why would a larger size give a man an advantage? Working on species with short lifespans, researchers are starting to understand these evolutionary mechanisms. When different individuals contribute more or less to the next generation and, and different individuals in a population, this can be caused by different uh, mechanisms or processes. It can either be that they uh, were more successful in reaching maturity or that they lived longer. And these kinds of differences are and selection pressures following from them are called a natural selection. It can also be that some individuals were just more successful at finding a mate or attracting mates, or a, that they were competing better in the mating market. That's what people sometimes say. And then this is called sexual selection. That's another kind of sexual selection pressure. But very often these two processes and kinds of selection pressure, they, they, they interact. A larger size for males, then, would have to give them an advantage in the competition for survival or reproduction. Since Darwin, the increase in male size has often been explained by what he called the law of combat. So are men just rutting stags? Bigger and stronger to be better fighters? Competition between males generates selection, generates the evolution of characteristics that enable males to keep, compete successfully. And one of those, in some species, is body size. So in animals that fight by pushing, where males actually compete with each other, fight with each other by locking antlers or locking horns, body size is really important, and the evolution of male size has got to a larger level in many of these species than the evolution of female size. So male competition in animals like deer and, uh, and antelope generates benefits of large size to males, and that has led to a situation where male size has evolved to be larger than female size. But there are costs too, because if you're big, you require more food, and when food is short, you're more likely to starve. So that in a lot of cases where there's acute starvation, may, when, where males are considerably bigger than females, males are much more likely to die than females, and males may die before females start commonly to die. So males pay a cost of that sex difference in body size. These larger males would be more successful at reproducing and passing on their genes, but would be the first to starve in times of shortage. That's a bit awkward. The large size which benefits the species as a whole is a real burden for individuals, showing that an advantage can also be a drawback. So why would this contradiction come about? These differences are commonly related to the mating system. So typically in polygynous species, polygyny where one male mates with multiple females, males are bigger than females. Then there are other species where males and females are about the same size. So for example, in monogamous species like gibbons, where males and females typically mate for life, there is not a strong selection for body size in males, making them bigger than, than, than females, and we end up with males and females being about the same size. So if you look across all the properly monogamous mammals, males and females are almost always the same size. So there's an interesting point there that male and female humans 
are of course not the small the same size. Males are slightly larger than females, and that uh, suggests that at some stage in our past we've been predominantly poly polygynous. Commonly, males, individual males, have mated with several females, have bred with several females during their lifespan. Does this mean then that we're more like deer than gibbons? The men's larger body size is the sign of a fairly recent polygyny. In which case, men, like stags, would need the weapons to fight with. Weapons plain to see on their bodies. When primates compete, when males compete for access to females, um, selection favors the development of weapons that help them to win fights with one another. These are the teeth of a male mandrel. And this animal has a canine tooth here, which is one of the longest of any mammal. Within apes, this is the dentition of an orangutan. This is a male orangutan. And it also has very, very large teeth. Not as large as the mandrel, but very, very large. And the males use these to threaten each other and to bite. And they're obviously very, very nasty teeth. Now, if you look at bonobos, which is a kind of chimpanzee, where males do not fight very much with one another, the teeth of the male are much, much smaller. So the size of these teeth seems to correspond with how much they fight. And of course, in humans, we don't have big canine teeth. The males and females have canine teeth that are about the same size as one another. So this suggests to us that the males lost the canine teeth, probably because they stopped fighting at some point in our past for access to females. So on the one hand, we've lost the weapons for fighting for females, but on the other hand, we seem to have the differences in body size between males and females that suggest that there's still some force that's keeping the male and female size apart. And that, that means that the body size differences between males and females might have nothing to do with the competition and might be more consistent with what we see in the teeth. OK, all you big tough guys, you can put your clothes back on. Physical strength wasn't the evolutionary force driving the increase in body size. There's another form of sexual selection. If you're choosing your mate for life, you have to choose well. What if ladies simply prefer taller men? Darwin did in fact observe that in many species, it's the females who select their partners. What he called female choice. This results in males competing among themselves for a female's favours, showing off their brighter colours, better singing ability, or sometimes greater size. In many organisms we see that females have a preference for larger males. So when, when, when they have this, then a male which is larger than average will leave more descendants than average in the next generation. And so that sexual selection uh, will, will favour a the properties of such a male, and this can amplify the difference in size between females and males. There are, for example, very elegant experiments in widow birds where researchers artificially enlarged the tails of, uh, of males, and it was clear that females had a preference for, for these males that were not occurring in, in a natural population. So this preference for a bigger size has been demonstrated very often. So could it be our own preference for taller men that has created this size difference? That would really cap it all. Il y a une taille idéale, elle est même extrêmement précise. C'est 1m82, 6 feet. Voilà, c'est la, la, la taille idéale. L'avantage du grand, c'est que, bien sûr, il est d'abord désiré par toutes les autres. Alors donc, c'est quand même quelque chose qui est quand même un argument pour toute femme en particulier, savoir que la, le choix des autres se porte sur quelqu'un que elle-même elle pourrait choisir. Donc. C'est en quelque sorte une rassurance mutuelle des femmes entre elles en se disant puisque les autres, puisque les autres femmes aiment les grands, c'est peut-être quand même un choix sûr parce que tout on ne va pas se tromper en même temps. Par exemple, il y a une très belle étude sur les, les, les officiers de West Point en, en, en Amérique. Des sociologues américains ont pris toute une promotion de 500-600 officiers et ils les ont retrouvés au moment où ces derniers terminaient leur temps. Ils leur ont fait reconstituer l'ensemble de leur vie conjugale. Et ce qui apparaissait clairement, c'est que dans cette promotion d'officier, qui était donc très homogène, 
tous des hommes du même âge, de la même génération, vous voyez, tous ayant le même niveau de diplôme élevé, parce qu'il faut avoir des diplômes élevés pour devenir officier à West Point, tous ayant des expériences professionnelles, les habits à se déplacer, etc., identiques. Et pourtant, à l'arrivée, on constatait que les grands avaient eu plusieurs épouses, alors que les petits n'en avaient eu qu'une. Humans of all the primates are probably some of the most difficult to study because we lie, we mate in private and in secret, which other animals don't do. It's very difficult to go out as a scientist with a clipboard and you know, study our mating patterns and our choice of mates. Um, as a consequence of that, it makes it very difficult to pin down why females will prefer taller males and what the consequences of that are for the female. They might prefer taller males because taller males are genetically superior. Maybe they give better offspring. Maybe it's that taller males are better able to compete with other males for resources, and that those resources then confer a benefit to the female in lowering her infant mortality and in increasing her reproductive output. It could be that taller men are better able to protect the female from other males and to protect her offspring. That's quite a few criteria to work through. Is it really then just a man's height which turns a girl's head? What's true for the birds is not necessarily true for man, or even less, perhaps, for woman. If it isn't sexual selection, it would have to be natural selection. What if men, who did the more physically demanding job of hunting, grew bigger, while women, who did the gathering, stayed smaller? After all, taller giraffes were selected because they could reach their food more easily. Biologists have upheld this idea. Larger men would be better hunters and handier at physical tasks, which would have favoured their selection all over the world. What's the situation among present-day hunter-gatherers such as the Baka in Cameroon? Are larger men the best hunters? And is it an advantage for the women doing the gathering to remain smaller? This is no longer a question for biologists. We now turn to the ethnologists who study our different human cultures. There are populations petites qui chassent autant que des populations plus grandes. Les hommes font un, un gros travail, évidemment, quand ils vont à la chasse. Ce n'est pas facile de faire la chasse. Par contre, les femmes ont un travail aussi dur que, et fatigant que la chasse. Mais c'est vrai que les femmes font un travail plus continuel. Elles ont rarement des grands moments de repos. Dans tout le monde, à partir de l'Australie, il y a des, des, des groupes australiens qu'on a, on a étudiés, comme des groupes euh, de, de, de l'Amazonie, comme des groupes de, africains, comme les Kung du Kalahari. Il y a des descriptions d'une journée de collecte de, de deux, deux petites femmes, petites parce qu'elles sont vraiment petites comme corps, genre 1m40 et même moins, qui, qui passent la journée de 12-15 km aller-retour dans une chaleur épouvantable avec les enfants, avec, elles ramassent des choses, elles déterrent des racines, elles rentrent avec un poids de 20-25 kg sur les bras, le dos. Donc c'est un travail extrêmement fatigant. All the same, it took ethnologists years to reach the conclusion that hunter-gatherer women labor just as hard as or even harder than men. In fact, the idea that the division of labor has some biological significance is merely a cliché that's particularly tenacious. Women are neither weak nor fragile. 
that human societies have always prized the work done by men and considered that done by women to be inferior. Men, then, are not giraffes. It wasn't the search for food which made them taller. The problem is that none of the models which explain the increase in male size works very well for our particular species. So there's no answer. But what if it's the wrong question? Lots of people have ad addressed the question, why do you get sexual dimorphism? Why do you get this difference? And the interesting thing is that most people have asked a question that is actually a sexist question. Uh, but you don't realize. The question is, why are males bigger than females? And what that implies is the female is somehow the passive baseline and natural selection acts on the males to make them bigger for some reason. But we can also turn that question around and instead of asking why the male is bigger than the female, we can say, why is the female smaller than the male? So we women aren't this passive baseline. Evolutionary processes apply equally to us, of course. And if our size can vary, that means we can get taller too. It wasn't until the advent of the great feminist movements that scientists started looking at the problem the other way round taking an interest in the size of women. In 1976, not so very long ago, a scientific paper was published unnoticed by almost everyone. It was the first ever study of mammal species in which the females are larger than the males. Catherine Rawls was in charge of the research. In many cases, it seemed like it had to do with, with the, the being a good mother or a, a bit of a, uh, <laughs> a larger mother was a better mother either to defend the young or for energetic reasons, like in the whales. Um, all those whales migrate and they eat in the cold waters in the north and then they have to completely give birth and, and uh, nurse their baby with just their stored energy. And so they need to be, I think, larger so they can put on a lot of fat and accomplish this because they, some of them don't eat at all when they're in the warmer tropical waters taking care of their baby, for example. The cost of lactation is energetically very high. Uh, I don't know exactly quantitatively, but depending on, on uh, how many babies you have and, and uh, how fast it grows, it can be, it's, an enorm it's really an enormous cost that the males do not have to expend. So it's better to be big when you're a female mammal and have young to suckle. OK, we don't live in the chilly ocean, but surely this also holds true for us primates. We're a very big primate. There's only one other primate that's bigger than us, and that's the gorilla. It has been an advantage for females to be big, and therefore that might explain why there's so little difference in size between humans, given how big we are. And the thing there is it really pays the female to produce an offspring with as large a brain as possible. The brain grows a lot after birth, but the safest place for a brain to grow is inside the woman. So it pays her to keep the baby inside, the fetus inside, as long as possible. Then it pays the woman to be big. And so there could have been advantages to human females to have um, grown bigger than you would expect, given our large body size. So they have a benefit of being big that other primates don't have. So among all primate females, it's we humans who get the most benefit from a larger size, keeping our babies in our wombs as long as possible. The problem comes, of course, when it's time for these big brain babies to be born. It's a painful and risky ordeal. L'homme est un, un singe très particulier et qui a des, des caractères tout à fait originaux. Parmi ces caractères, euh, les plus remarquables sont certainement son très grand cerveau 
et puis aussi son mode de locomotion qui est un mode de locomotion bipède. Sur le plan squelettique, il y a des modifications très importantes. Euh, le rachis, hein, la colonne vertébrale qui doit soutenir le, le corps, l'axe du corps. Et puis, pour les paléontologues, il y a une partie du, du squelette qui est euh, tout à fait remarquable, sont les membres inférieurs et puis surtout le bassin. Et ce bassin humain, il a justement une forme en bassin, c'est-à-dire c'est une cuvette qui soutient... Euh, les organes internes, alors que chez euh, les grands singes, qui se tiennent volontiers en position quadrupède, le bassin, c'est plutôt une espèce d'arche auquel euh, les, les viscères sont suspendus. Donc on a la nécessité d'avoir euh, un bassin avec une, une forme relativement étroite, euh, parce que c'est celle qui permet euh, la marche et l'adaptation à la course, qui est une autre caractéristique des hommes. Avoir la morphologie du bassin que nous avons, ça représente un gros avantage pour être un bipède efficace et un bipède coureur. Avoir un gros cerveau, ça représente aussi un gros avantage à des tas de, de points de vue. Mais euh, on, voit, on comprend bien que euh, cela implique euh, des contraintes et, euh, j'allais dire, une certaine complication euh, quand il s'agit de mettre au monde des enfants, euh, d'êtres d'une espèce qui ont euh, ces grands cerveaux et ce bassin relativement étroit. Et donc, euh, voilà, le prix à payer, si je peux dire, euh, pour notre grand cerveau et notre bipédie, eh bien, c'est cet accouchement qui est particulièrement difficile chez les hommes, euh, douloureux pour les femmes, avec un mécanisme compliqué de, de rotation du nouveau-né au cours de, de la naissance. Human history is full of recipes, remedies and expressions for the agony undergone by women during this happy event, this labor, which ends with a delivery. In 18th century Europe, a quarter of deaths of women under 50 were linked to pregnancy. Childbirth is something of an obstacle course. Le fœtus, pour sortir des voies génitales maternelles, va emprunter ce qu'on appelle l'excavation pelvienne, qui comporte des détroits, des rétrécissements. Trois rétrécissements, ici ce que l'on appelle le détroit supérieur, qui est l'orifice d'entrée dans l'excavation pelvienne, Ici, le détroit moyen au niveau des épines sciatiques et ici, le détroit inférieur. Donc une contrainte pour se dégager dans un diamètre antéro-postérieur. Vous voyez cette mécanique complexe de entrer dans un diamètre oblique, descente et rotation curviligne, puis rotation pour un dégagement antéro-postérieur. On peut comprendre aisément que des anomalies de développement du bassin puissent rendre très difficile ou impossible l'accouchement par les voies naturelles. Un exemple de, de bassin tout à fait pathologique dû à des euh, anomalies de euh, nutrition qui vont conduire à ces déformations du bassin. Et on comprend bien qu'il est tellement anormal qu'il est impossible qu'un enfant puisse pénétrer dans l'excavation pelvienne et euh, être expulsé hors des voies génitales maternelles. These maneuvers are so precise that we humans have the highest childbirth mortality rates among all the primates. In countries with modern medical facilities, small women with narrow pelvises can usually give birth without a problem, by caesarean section if necessary. This is the case with around 15% of births. But in countries without such medical care, the situation is such as it was in the West until fairly recently, with one woman dying in childbirth every minute from obstetric complications, making this the major cause of death among women. And for every woman dying in childbirth, 10 others suffer serious lesions. In countries where malnutrition is a problem, a woman under 1 meter 50 has her chance of a successful delivery halved. Such matters were of little interest to scientists, while problematic childbirth was accepted as inevitable. But the early years of the present century greeted a new generation of researchers whose speciality is questioning whether the seemingly natural differences between men and women are merely social constructs. This new discipline, gender studies, brings radical points of view to bear on numerous other disciplines. 
les pressions de, de sélection euh, naturelle sur, euh, pour l'augmentation de, 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 la, de la stature dans la lignée euh, homo ont été des pressions de sélection obstétriques, disent les paléanthropologues. Et euh, donc en fait, c'était les femmes qui avaient des pressions de sélection euh, pour une grande taille. Et euh, si on suit cette hypothèse, euh, en fait, ce seraient les femmes qui devraient euh, être aussi grandes ou plus grandes que les hommes dans notre espèce. Ce monde-là est le monde euh, qui, euh, qui aurait dû euh, advenir euh, si on était justement dans un, dans un, dans un modèle de, euh, de sélection optimale, euh, de, de, de sélection naturelle optimale. We women should have grown bigger then. The old cliched illustration of evolution should have featured a woman, not a man. So why aren't we bigger? What held us back, even at the risk of our dying in childbirth? In all species, it's smaller individuals that survive better when resources are lacking. In times of famine, it's better to be small, especially in the long term. But what if it was something other than a simple shortage of food? What if it was the access to food that was the decisive factor? Primatologists have observed a particular kind of behavior among our close cousins. Fights between the sexes over food, absolutely, definitely. And if the male is a lot bigger than the female, uh, the male uh, defeats the female over food. And we, even with gorillas, even where there's greenery everywhere, have seen um, males walk up to females, push the female away from a patch of good food, sit there and eat the food, and the female then has to go somewhere else. Well, with the chimpanzees, we know there's definitely competition over meat. Serious competition over meat. They love meat. And the males tend to um, kill the animals in the forest where the chimpanzees do hunt. The males tend to do the killing. But if a female happens to kill, the male will take it away from the female. And the females really can't get at the meat themselves. The males are holding it to them. The females are not strong enough to get it from the males. The males are completely in charge of the meat. And so the females suffer from having the males around, but there's nothing they can do about it. It's the law of the jungle among our cousins, the chimpanzees. What with the males fighting among themselves for the right to mate and taking all the choice bits of food, it's not surprising the females are smaller. Yet they're the ones suckling the young. They have to make do with insects and young shoots to meet their protein needs. In our species, did you know it's the women who are more in need of meat? During pregnancy and while breastfeeding, we need 30% more animal protein than men and five times more iron. Iron is also essential to prevent the risk of anemia during periods. Meat is a source of easily assimilated protein and iron. Once men are fully grown, they mostly need the slow-release carbohydrates necessary for muscle work. They don't have periods, don't get pregnant, and don't suckle young. For them, meat isn't indispensable. So could our species, too, engage in competition for food? Siberia. After a reindeer has been slaughtered, the woman presents the meat to her husband while she gnaws at the bones. If you're a woman, you make do with the leftovers. Uganda. When families sit down to eat, the men are always served first. By the time the young girls get a chance, there's no meat left. Morocco. The men eat before the children and women, who learn to refuse meat. India. At mealtimes, the woman feeds her husband and children, boys before girls. It's common to find households in which the women are vegetarians, but not the men. 
The Auvergne. Not so long ago, women didn't sit at the table, but spent their time going from oven to table, serving the master of the family. Then they'd eat whatever was left over. If there was a bird, they'd get the carcass and neck. If a rabbit, the head. Sur mon propre terrain, au Burkina, alors que j'y allais depuis déjà euh, une vingtaine d'années, de façon régulière, en mission, eh j'ai mis à peu près ce temps avant de m'apercevoir d'une chose qui aurait dû me crever les yeux dès le début, c'était l'alimentation différentielle des bébés, selon qu'ils sont garçons ou filles. Parce que je voyais bien que ce n'était pas automatique que les mères ne donnaient pas systématiquement à un bébé dès qu'il pleurait. Et moi, je mettais ça en prise directe sur la nécessité de l'occupation. Elle avait une occupation très urgente. Donc quand elle était très urgente, elle faisait attendre le bébé. Si elle avait plus de temps, elle lui donnait à boire. Et puis un beau jour, je me suis aperçue que c'était au, au bébé mâle qu'elle donnait à boire et les bébés filles qu'elle faisait attendre. Il m'a fallu un temps fou pour le remarquer. Et quand j'ai posé la question, elle me disait toute, oui, quand un garçon pleure, il faut lui donner à boire tout de suite parce qu'il a le corps rouge. Donc si on ne lui donne pas de fureur, il va éclater, il va se faire du mal. Donc il faut lui donner. Tandis qu'une fille, on la fait attendre. Et pourquoi Alors là, on va avoir une raison sociologique et non plus physiologique. On me répondait, parce qu'une femme ne sera jamais satisfaite dans toute sa vie et qu'il faut le lui apprendre des dès le départ, de lui apprendre la frustration dès le départ. Et c'est quand même intéressant, parce qu'effectivement, vous créez de la sorte de variétés humaines totalement différentes dans leurs attentes, l'une qui, de façon extrêmement naturelle, et c'est normal, puisque c'est comme ça qu'elle a été élevée, va attendre la satisfaction immédiate de tous ses besoins et de toutes ses pulsions, et l'autre qui va être destiné à attendre le bien vouloir de quelqu'un d'autre. C'est quand même extraordinaire comme dressage. Et ça passe par l'alimentaire. The UN's Food and Agriculture Organization has just started to investigate food discrimination between men and women. Women today are twice as likely as men to suffer from malnutrition, and the risk of death is twice as high for girls as for boys. Women more often suffer a deficiency of animal protein which results in a smaller size, a narrow pelvis, anemia, and the likelihood of problematic childbirth with dramatic consequences. En fait, les discours de justification des inégalités alimentaires sont euh, majoritairement sur l'idée que c'est les garçons qui ont besoin d'être grands et pas les femmes. Quand vous avez une, une organisation sociale de la pénurie, c'est ça les inégalités alimentaires, c'est donc comme je disais, c'est plus écologique, c'est plus... Euh, c'est plus une compétition brute entre un mâle et une femelle qui se disputent la nourriture, mais c'est vraiment un système social organisé de pénurie, puisque si les femmes sont censées ne pas manger de la viande, par exemple, ne pas avoir accès à telle, à telle, à telle protéine, et les hommes, oui, euh, vous avez là un système de, 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 de pénurie organisé qui, qui vaut pour la, pour la vie d'une femme entière sur des générations et qui, qui perdure d'une manière culturelle sur, sur, sur des générations entières. Ça devient vraiment un ordre social et qui est beaucoup plus, euh, beaucoup plus systématique, si l'on peut dire, que, 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 dans le, que dans les espèces animales où il n'y a, a pas de règles sociales comme ça instaurées où on va dire les femelles ne doivent pas manger euh, euh, tel aliment. Euh, voilà. C'est plus de l'ordre de la compétition, c'est l'ordre vraiment de l'inégalité. C'est très facile pour les gens qui ont un pouvoir, que ce soit un pouvoir banal de classe ou, ou de race, etc., décider que les autres ont moins besoin qu'eux, <laughs> ont moins un droit qu'eux. And so, without even thinking about it, we feed our baby boys more than our baby girls and choose taller men to marry, thereby perpetuating this size difference. Does this mean that in every single human culture, you'll find inequality between men and women? Je dirais qu'il n'y a pas de société où on peut dire qu'il n'y a pas du tout de domination. 
C'est une aberration presque intellectuelle qu'on n'ait pas vu toutes ces choses-là jusqu'à maintenant. C'est incroyable. Appearances are deceptive. The situation seemed unalterable, but in fact it's a story in motion, all about domination, so all-pervasive that we don't even notice it. Our bodies, then, would be the living example of an inequality imposed on us for millennia, which is still at work, and for which there is absolutely no justification. So come on, girls, stand tall. <laughs>